Good afternoon, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Kevin Warner. I'm Vice President for Investment here at Emerald Cities Collaborative in the Washington, D.C. National Office. Thank you all very much for uh, participating in today's session on uh, Introduction to Energy Services Performance Contracting. And we're very, very, very pleased to have one of our new board members, Donald Gilligan, join us today. Uh, he's going to be putting on a little bit of a different hat, and we're going to call him Professor Gilligan, <laughs> of course. Um, so by way of introduction, Don is the president of the National Association of Energy Services Companies, otherwise known as NESCO, uh, where he is responsible for coordinating uh, NESCO's federal and state advocacy activities, as well as its relationships with other national and regional energy efficiency organizations like Emerald Cities Collaborative. Don has worked in the energy efficiency industry since 1975 as a consultant, an entrepreneur, and a state government official. He has authored and co-authored a number of reports on energy efficiency and the growth of the ESCO industry and has been published both by NESCO and the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. He's also a graduate of Harvard, but we won't hold that against him. As I said, Don is also, and probably more importantly for today's session, a new member, new, fairly new member of the National Board of Directors for Emerald Cities Collaborative, and we're very, very happy that Don has agreed to share uh, his knowledge of an industry that I think uh, sometimes puzzles some people. Uh, and so we thought it would be very helpful to have a session all about ESCOs, all about energy service performance contracting. And the way that we're going to run this today is a little bit of an open dialogue with uh, a little bit of structure. Um, Don has prepared a, uh, a deck that you see in front of you. And periodically throughout the presentation, we will stop and open it up to see if there are any burning questions. And then at the end, we're going to save hopefully 20 to 25 minutes for a, uh, a, round, of, a round robin of uh, questions and answers uh, amongst the group and with Don. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Don. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Um, I would like to apologize in advance to everybody who's watching the screen um, that I will be ducking my head and bobbing around because I uh, I wear bifocals, <laughs> so I'm trying to simultaneously look at what's on the screen and, and my notes in front of me. So it's not that people here at Emerald Cities are throwing things at me as I'm talking. Yeah, could everybody please mute your lines? If you're on the phone, please mute your line. Okay? Thank you. Okay. So, what I'm going to try to do is give you a, uh, a quick introduction to uh, energy savings performance contracting and discuss some of the potential that it has to generate significant employment immediately uh, and then to answer your questions about how performance contracting works and how we can all work together to make it work better. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> My presentation will have several sections. The first is, is simply an introduction to performance contracting, what it is. I'll talk about how it works. I'll give you some idea of the employment potential of, of performance contracting, a little bit of background on the U.S. ESCO industry, talk about some of the opposition to performance contracting in some parts of the country, um, and, uh, and suggest how, how I think we can go forward and, and realize the true potential of this vehicle. Most of you are aware, everybody is aware, I think, today that we need jobs all across the country. The recovery is very slow. In the construction industry, it's really not yet a recovery. 
in most parts of the country that the construction industry is suffering depression era levels of unemployment. At the same time, we know that local government facilities need a tremendous amount of capital improvements. When President Obama a few months ago introduced uh, the jobs program, he talked about the fact that the um, need for capital improvements in public schools was $250 billion. Um, the, um, <clears throat> even if you're a diehard Republican and you discredit everything the president says, and you may be discounted by 90%, we're still at $25 billion capital improvement needs just for public schools, never mind other local government facilities or state government facilities. So we have huge problem, and we're not making a whole lot of, uh, of progress towards it. We think that the performance contracting business can help uh, because performance contracting has delivered about $40 billion worth of projects in the last 20 years. We've provided about $50 billion of savings, which is guaranteed and verified savings more than almost 350,000 um, person years of employment now, $25 billion worth of, of improvements to public buildings, and uh, a tremendous amount of CO2 reduction at, at no cost. Uh, it's important to emphasize this last point. It's not just true of performance contracting, but it's true of all energy efficiency work. Energy efficiency delivers carbon reductions without any cost. The improvements pay for themselves with energy savings. The carbon reduction is, is simply a free benefit, a free side benefit. So <clears throat> what is performance contracting? How does it work? Uh, what kinds of services are provided and, and what kinds of measures or technologies are installed? Yes. Uh, you can let them know on slide five. Just can you can you advance in the slides because it's not available. Oh, I'm sorry. Apparently the uh, slides are not advancing automatically. So I will from now on uh, talk about um, talk in, as I talk through each slide. I'll tell you which slide we're on. So we're now on slide six. It has the title "What is ESPC?" Now we're back to slide two. Okay. Okay. We're on slide six. So performance contracting is also called just simply energy performance contracting. For those of you who know about construction, it's a type of design build project. Uh, performance contracting is a turnkey service in which one company provides the energy audit, engineering, construction management, helps with financing, uh, commissioning various technologies in the project, operations and maintenance in long-term M&V. It delivers a full range of energy efficiency, renewable energy, and distributed generation technologies. The projects are self-financing in that they're paid from savings, and the capital for the projects comes from third parties. There's a very competitive third party financing industry uh, that provides capital for the projects without the need for new taxes. Uh, we're on slide seven now. Performance contracting works basically by taking, let me just, let me go to the next slide. I think that's a better slide, slide eight. Um, this is the easiest way to explain it. What performance contracting does is essentially recycle money that is now being spent on wasted energy and uh, waste, in effect, wasted maintenance expenses on obsolete equipment and recycles that money into a payment stream <coughs> for capital improvements in public buildings. Uh, it's it's difficult for some people to get a, a handle on this uh, 
with that simple explanation until you understand that buildings on the average waste about a third of the energy that they purchase. Um, and you don't get anything for that money. So every, virtually every public school in the country, every city government, every state government is wasting about a third of their utility bill. They're not getting any value for that at all. So what we're doing is taking that, the money that's spent on that waste, and instead of just throwing it away, we're going to buy new lighting systems, new heating systems, new air conditioning systems, roofs, doors, windows, renewable energy systems, and um, what are called distributed generation systems. We're going to go back now to slide seven. Um, again, it's a little summary of what ESCO uh, provides. Uh, we identify savings opportunities. We implement the improvements uh, that are paid from savings. We help to arrange financing. We guarantee that the savings from the project will meet or exceed the debt payments that are required to cover the project cost. And if the ESCO misses its estimates, they actually write checks to pay for the savings shortfalls. Now we're going to go skip past slide eight, which we've talked about, and go to slide nine. The next couple of slides are just summaries of what ESCOs provide. So the first slide is the services. I, I won't read it to you. You can read it yourself. It's the full set of services required to deliver a project. The next slide, slide 10, um, is the description of why an ESCO is different in this situation. One company delivers all of the services. One company ex assumes the project technical risk and the project costs are paid from savings. These are, these are real differences from traditional public construction contracting. Um, next slide. So we're now on slide 11. Uh, typical measures that are installed in performance contracts, lighting, heating, air conditioning, energy management systems, building envelope measures, which means doors, windows, roofs, uh, in building insulation, um, water conservation. Next slide has some advanced measures that are installed in some projects, renewable energy in certain parts of the country where there are, there are utility subsidies or incentives for renewable energy measures, distributed generation, demand response, water metering, street and traffic lighting. Sometimes ESCOs deliver a whole project for a, um, a small city or town government where they, they'll do all of the buildings plus replace the street lights and the traffic lights. And finally, um, a number of ESCOs are doing building sustainability measures. So help the building achieve lead uh, status <coughs> In, uh, in their buildings or in a, in a whole uh, campus facility. Next slide, please. Uh, performance contracting is available all across the country. Every, virtually every state and local government wastes a tremendous amount of energy. Every state, local government area that I know of um, has Construction people ready to work, engineers, architects, uh, construction trades of, of all sorts. Um, and every state has competitive private finance industry with the capital required to make these projects go. And there's actually a tremendous amount of capital sitting on the sidelines waiting to be put to productive use of projects like this. Next slide. Um, maybe we should stop here, Kevin, and, and um, see if there are some questions. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to submit them using the chat feature. Um, so while while you're uh, while you're all thinking of your interim questions, 
um, I wanted to ask a question of Don, actually, because one of the things that, that I think uh, everybody involved with Emerald Cities um, feels in terms of frustration about not the ESCO industry but, but energy efficiency is we, we feel like there's just not a lot of market momentum right now. And while there appears to be capital out there ready to invest and there certainly are, is, is no shortage of opportunities to create efficiency in, in public and, and other buildings, it seems like the market just isn't moving very quickly. Does, you know, from, from the ESCO perspective, what do you think is is making that happen? What are the barriers right now to making this market more robust? Well, I, you have to look at the energy efficiency market in different market segments. You can't just talk about the industry because when you're talking about energy efficiency in buildings, you're talking about all different kinds of buildings owned by different kinds of people and different institutions. Most of the work that ESCOs do is in public buildings state, local, and federal government buildings. In those areas, the biggest um, impediment or the biggest barrier is simply bureaucratic resistance. There are um, any number of states, any number of examples that uh, we can talk about that where there is a state bureaucracy or a local government bureaucracy that is actually stopping projects from happening or stopping whole programs from happening. A few months ago, President Obama announced, for example, a $2 billion initiative in federal buildings to try to do $2 billion worth of performance contracts in federal facilities over the next two years. He gave the agencies, all of the federal agencies, one month to submit their list of potential projects, their commitments. So how much of this $2 billion uh, pledge by the president would each agency do? Within about a month or six weeks, the government had collected the pledges. And they totaled well more than $2 billion. So we know that the projects are sitting there. The question is, can the president and the, at the federal level put in enough pressure to get these projects moving and to get people back to work? It's a tremendous amount of employment, pent up employment just sitting there. Uh, the capital is all available, um, and, but it's really just bureaucratic resistance. Same thing happens obviously with smaller numbers in many state governments and in, and in local governments. Uh, NASCO did a survey a couple of years ago, three years ago I think now, of 12 state governments. Um, it's a survey sponsored, funded by the U.S. Department of Energy. We were trying to look at how much energy efficiency had been done in state facilities in these 12 states. Well, the first thing we found was that in four of the 12 states, there wasn't anybody who could tell us how many buildings they owned. Uh, in six of the 12 states, there was no central information about energy expenditures. So right off the bat, you know that you're in trouble. Uh, you know, we all know the management maxim, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Well, how about if you can't even count it? Never mind measure it. Um, and, and once we got past that barrier and we found, we, we dug into what had actually been done in these various state governments in their own facilities, we found that in one state, about 75% of the state facilities, including the university systems, prisons across the board, had been retrofitted with comprehensive projects. At the other end of the spectrum in these 12 states, uh, we found a state where there was basically nothing done. And it would, might surprise you to learn that the state where basically nothing was done was California, which has long had the reputation of um, 
being you know, tremendous leader, world leader in energy efficiency, has no state performance contracting program. I uh, worked a few months ago with a new, another new national organization uh, called the Advanced Energy Economy, and we were looking at um, potential projects. Where could we start making a real impact? And of course, based on my experience in California, where I worked for several years trying to get a state buildings program going there. I said, well, why don't we work in California? You guys are headquartered there. Um, so people in the organization, not me, located one of the former, um, I forget whether it was the, I guess it was an assistant secretary in the uh, Department of General Services who um, had been there for several years during the Schwarzenegger administration when we were trying and the governor was trying through what was called the Green Buildings Initiative to get state buildings really moving towards energy efficiency. Uh, the Green Buildings Initiative failed at the state government level and his advice, uh, this gentleman's advice, this former assistant secretary was this is not worth your time. This is a big country, lots of productive things to do. Uh, DGS will just stop this program dead in its tracks. So, so Don, that's a, that's a story of the, of the worst kind of bureaucracy that we face in this marketplace. But there are stories of, of public entities, local governments, um, special purpose organizations, nonprofits out there who really are trying to move this market. And a, a question from uh, one of our participants, Steve Gelb, is, Let's say you have a motivated school district who really wants to do this. And uh, you have a, a motivated school district who really wants to do this work. And they have their own money. They, they're willing to issue bonds. Um, can they accelerate the process by working with ESCOs? And can they save even more money by self-financing to reinvest into deeper retro? Well, two separate questions. Um, typically, a, a school district does not have the in-house expertise to develop a project and implement a project itself. So it, it is useful to, to, um, to retain an ESCO to do that. Uh, I think virtually every state in the country now has uh, procedures about how to compete an ESCO project. Uh, there are uh, lots of resources which I will outline at the end of this presentation about where a local school district, for example, can go to get all of the documentation you need to, to, to run the project from the side of the school district. In terms of the, the financing, what's interesting today is that there is not a lot of difference, uh, particularly for local government projects, between the cost of bonds and the cost of, of private financing, like uh, municipal lease financing. So it's prob there's probably about a half a point, or, or um, in financial lingo, 50 basis points difference between a bond issue and a, uh, a municipal lease financing. The US EPA has actually developed a tool, a software tool, to help local government agencies analyze the cash flows resulting from different kinds of financing proposals and to analyze what, what US EPA calls the cost of delay. So for most people, it, it, it would seem to make sense, for example, if you could uh, wait for a year or two to do an energy efficiency project uh, and, and get a capital allocation from the budget you'd be much better off doing that than borrowing the money and doing it today. Well, this cash flow analysis tool shows that that's not true. That then you, you sacrifice a significant amount of the net present value of a project by waiting uh, for, for financing. Okay. So we're going to get back to, uh, to Don's uh, presentation and then we'll stop again in a few minutes for more questions. And uh, Gary, don't worry, I made note of your question and we will definitely ask that first up next time. So I'm going to switch uh, a little bit now and um, <clears throat> go from the, 
the, the basic description of what a performance contracting project is to a, a bigger description of, of what the potential market is out there. Uh, and the, most of these numbers are going to come from work that NASCO has done with the Lawrence Berkeley Lab over the last few years to gather information about the size of the potential market and, uh, and, and the uh, investments that are uh, required to, to meet the needs that we've identified. So the first slide just shows how much energy savings is available in public buildings across the country. Different levels of public buildings, everything from federal to K, federal facilities to uh, K to 12 schools and local school districts. It's a, there's a tremendous amount of, of energy savings available that's being energy that's being wasted. And again, it's important to, to understand that this wasted energy represents billions of dollars of public expenditures that are just buying nothing. They're not, they're not buying services, they're not buying comfort, they're not buying employment, they're, they're just wasted. The next slide tries to translate those energy efficiency, or excuse me, those available energy savings into the kind of investment that, be, that would be required to meet the needs of bringing these buildings up to a substantial level of energy efficiency. This is just public buildings. We're looking at a market on this slide of about $75 billion uh, work that we've done since these slides were put together a couple of years ago indicates that that estimate is probably light. We're probably looking now at something on the order of $100 billion. It's a good round number um, of investments that could be made in public facilities today that would pay for themselves. So we're simply taking money that's spent on wasted energy, translating it into a, a funding stream for capital improvements. So we're looking at $100 billion worth of potential capital investment. Um, the next slide takes that example uh, and looks at particularly at the state of Georgia. And I'll explain in a minute why we picked the state of Georgia. But it was, this is simply a slide using the uh, US EPA tool, which I talked about a minute ago, um, that estimates what the potential market for energy efficiency projects in Georgia state buildings. This isn't local government buildings or school districts. This is just the state buildings. So we're looking at more than a half a billion dollars worth of, of public building improvements, which could be done tomorrow, which could pay for themselves. Next slide. And what does this translate into into jobs? Well, we've done a lot of work over the years, and other lots of other agencies and think tanks and universities have looked at the energy, uh, the potential for job creation from energy efficiency projects. Uh, our best estimate is that. Every $1 million of project value creates about nine and a half direct jobs. And those are jobs in the, in the ESCO company, in local subcontractors, and in equipment manufacturers and distributors. As everybody knows, if you're creating direct jobs, you're also creating <coughs> indirect or implied jobs as the money that you pay for the original employment circulates in the community. And, and we think that generates about another 12 jobs for every million dollars worth of project. So you're looking at potentially you know, 20, 22 jobs per million dollars of employment. I'm sorry, per million dollars of, of project value. Run those numbers out across the country and you're looking at hundreds of thousands of jobs. 
the reason that we picked the state of Georgia, or that I picked the state of Georgia for these slides, is because there's a very interesting example from about 18 months ago that shows that the public really supports performance contracting in a way that I think bears on the question that Kevin asked a few minutes ago. How do you break some of these barriers? We had a situation on election day in the fall of 2010 where there were two ballot issues um, on state ballots in two separate states, one in Washington and one in Georgia. In Washington, there was a $500 million bond issue for improvements in public schools, largely energy efficiency improvements. <coughs> as many of you, of you know, Georgia, excuse me, Washington is a very progressive state in terms of energy efficiency programs. It's had a long history of programs generously funded. Uh, that initiative in Washington was voted down very substantially. <coughs> I think that no's were more than 60% of the vote. In Georgia, which by contrast to Washington, has a very modest history of energy efficiency programs, and I think most people would consider Georgia a pretty conservative state, we actually had to get a constitutional amendment passed to allow performance contracting in state buildings. That amendment on the same day as the, the vote in Washington turned down the, the program, <coughs> the Georgia program passed by a very substantial margin, again about 60%. The difference is that we were able to make the case that in Georgia, with a performance contracting program, the energy efficiency savings would pay for the improvements. In Washington, it was going to be a bond issue and the, um, it, was, it was going to result in new taxes. So we think that demonstrates pretty conclusively that the public support on this contract and that public officials across the country can reach out to their constituents, whether it's at the local government level or the state level, and, and really get people enthused about performance contracting programs. Okay, maybe this is a place for another pause to talk about this. If people have any questions about the uh, industry size or potential. So um, I understand also that we're having some audio problems and we're trying to correct those right now. Uh, so bear with us, please. We're, we're working to get the audio back on. Um, and uh, so, Don, um, one of the, the questions that came earlier was, um, you know, what, what can we be doing, uh, that, you know, the Emerald City family, what can we be doing as a nonprofit with national reach, uh, with grassroots connections in our cities, in our communities? Um, you know, how can we move this market? How can we persuade the decision makers to move forward on these large-scale investments in these projects that will obviously not only uh, achieve the environmental objectives of saving energy, but put a lot of people back to work? Because that, as you know, is one of the, the fundamental missions of our organization. Well, my suggestion is that uh, the there's people in the individual uh, Emerald City chapters in, di in different cities across the country do a little bit of research about what has gone on in their local community, both the city government and the, and the county government, or depending on how the individual uh, area is, is organized. It could be county government, it could be a, a, a consolidated a county and municipal government. Um, it's relatively easy to find out if that government agency or the government agencies in that area have, in fact, done comprehensive energy efficiency projects. If they haven't, I think that that becomes a, a good target of activity for the Emerald City collaborative in that area that there is a market sitting there, 
there is a, a, a win-win, if you will. It's not like you're doing work in a, in a privately owned building. If you are doing work in a public building or a public facility, you, will, you are saving energy, you're improving the environment, and you're improving the public facility with no additional cost to the taxpayers. So it's a real benefit to everybody. And I think that that's a, a good place to start. I think once once you've identified areas of particular communities in your area that have not done these comprehensive projects, and one of the things that Emerald City, uh, from the national level, can do is begin to show you how to reach out and how to get started organizing a program to do these kinds of retrofits in schools and public buildings. So, Don, um, there was another question about the feedbacks for some of these investments, but I know that we are going to talk about that uh, a little bit later in the presentation, so maybe we should move into that next section and we'll come upon that question in a minute. Okay. Okay. Um, so the next section is just going to give you a little background on the ESCO industry and answer some of the questions that, that Kevin just, just um, asked for instance about payback. I'm not going to plow through each of these slides in great detail because we've talked about some of the issues already, but just try and give you a, a picture of what's going on. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the U.S. ESCO industry um, is, is really on two levels. There's a group of national companies, about 30 companies, that are, with, the, with a couple of exceptions, um, members of NACE. Uh, we represent, according to, again, studies by Lawrence Berkeley Lab, about 90 or 90 plus percent of the total ESCO industry in, in, the, in the country. Uh, we delivered about $5 billion for the projects in 2010 and in 2011. Uh, we've already talked about the fact that this is a, the, the work that ESCO is doing is a, um, it's a specialized construction business. It delivers large, comprehensive projects. So these are not the projects that are done by ESCOs are not single technology projects. So it's not going through the school district, for example, and changing out all the lighting systems and not doing anything else. These are comprehensive approaches to building that are designed to try and save as much energy as possible and to really modernize the, the public facility to um, the last to the next generation. Uh, public sector is about 80% um, of the business in, uh, in the U.S. ESCO industry. Uh, and building improvements is a major driver in, in a lot of these projects. The, um, uh, as much as we would hope that it would be true, the, the unfortunate fact is that there are not all that many people who are driven every day by saving the planet or saving energy. There are particularly people that are running buildings, public facilities, they're much more interested in keeping the building running, keeping it running economically, and, and making um, best use of their, of their maintenance personnel. So what we have found over the last decade or so is that building improvements and the need for building improvements is a major driver of these energy efficiency projects. Because quite frankly, given the fiscal environment, the people that are running public facilities don't have many places to turn up the capital to make the improvements which they need. But there, in fact, as we talked about earlier in the slide, the waste of energy is a source of capital. You don't need a, a new budget allocation. You don't need a new bond issue. You're sitting on top of 
a, a stream of funds which can pay for these capital improvements which are desperately needed in many school districts. Uh, next slide is just shows, shows that the industry has grown dramatically over the last couple of decades. Uh, next slide is uh, uh, where the USFCO industry is working today. The mush, the mush market, the big TAM uh, segment, which is almost uh, three quarters of the national market, is municipal, uh, universities, schools, and hospitals. So that state and local government facility, plus federal facility, plus public housing, and you're up for almost to 90% of contracting arrangements. Uh, most of the work is performance-based, which means they're guaranteed. And uh, technologies, a whole range of technologies, uh, mostly energy efficiency, but uh, an increasing percentage of renewables and, uh, and on site generation for combined heat and power. Two more slides. Two more slides. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've tried to, 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 to lay out a, a, um, a story, an attractive story about performance contracting and why I think it makes sense for uh, Emerald City to be involved in promoting performance contracting. But I think I'd also like to bring up a subject that uh, Emerald City will have to deal with if it begins to look at performance contracting series. And that is that in many parts of the country, unions and contractors don't like performance contracting. Because it's a different approach to the business. Um, this is particularly true of the contractors uh, who, who think, and rightfully so, that performance contracting represents a competitive approach to doing building improvements. And quite frankly, performance contracting has had a lot more success over the last few years than traditional public construction contracting because there isn't a lot of money to do traditional construction contracting. So NASCO has spent time, I have spent time personally over the last uh, couple of years dealing with legislation across the country that would effectively um, if not outlaw performance contract and change it in a way that um, would make it very impact. We think that and we think that unions particularly unions that get involved in um, those in supporting those types of legislation are making a real mistake because the alternative to performance contracting is not traditional project. It's no project. In every state in the country where there is a vibrant performance contracting industry, the alternative, the traditional staffing bid public construction system, has not been removed. It's, it's available as an alternative any day of the week. The fact that it hasn't been used, or it hasn't been used that much to do energy efficiency projects, means that that whole system just doesn't work very well. And in fact, the reason why performance contracting is with the lab is because the traditional system fell down on the job of developing and implementing energy efficiency projects. So I think you'll see over the next few years across the country um, this discussion or even legislative battle about performance contracting versus traditional public construction. And uh, we'd like very much to engage with local chapters of Emerald City and their union constituents to explain why we think that that is a, it's not a good idea for the uh, unions to be opposing these programs, for the unions to be opposing performance money. Rather, they should be supporting it because it can be a huge economic development and employment engine for their members. <coughs> so, there seems to be a number of questions uh, drawn about how Emerald City and our stakeholders group can work effectively with ESCO and with NASCO to, to really sort of partner uh, into the future uh, by bringing 
um, unions together with uh, energy services companies and sort of jointly approaching state and local government to move this market um, a lot further and a lot faster. Any particular thoughts on that? I don't think there's well, I don't think there's any. There's somebody said there's no magic bullet in this um, in this world of energy efficiency and environmental um, uh, progress. There's magic buckshot. So I think the answer is going to be different in each area. Um, I think that, um, as I said before, I think that Emerald Cities, as a local group, can have a significant impact on the local policy. Um, I think that NASCO is certainly willing and, and eager to get involved in discussions with individual Emerald Cities chapters as, as we're getting involved at the national level to talk with uh, union, uh, various, various construction unions at both the national level and the local level and to, to figure out jointly how we move forward. We don't have any, we don't have the plan <laughs> in our pocket. Uh, what we have, I think, is a willingness to work with Emerald Cities and to work with its union constituents to figure out how to go forward and how to make how to make these programs work and how to get people back to work quickly rebuilding our public schools. John, you mentioned a, a law in California that opposes uh, performance contracting, proposed law. Do you know the citation of that? Well, it was that law was last year. It was Senate Bill 118. It was, a, it was a law that was sponsored by a um, state senator. State Senator from San Francisco, uh, Leland Yee, um, who was at that point running for mayor of San Francisco. Um, it was uh, a law that that would have uh, outlawed the way that performance contracts are developed through uh, our requests for qualification and requests across the state. Uh, we got involved. Uh, with Senator Yee, it turned out that he really didn't understand how uh, the performance contracting industry worked and honestly didn't really understand all that much about how construction worked. And we were able to to get him to um, you know, to change the law, to change his, his draft law and eventually to withdraw the law. It's significant that in that um, legislative fight, the strongest opponents to Senator Yee's bill were the local government school districts. The ESCO industry was opposed, but the, what really turned the tide was the, the opposition of the local government. So, Don, how, we, we talked a little bit about um, contracts and, and that, um, the, the savings uh, on the energy costs. Uh, is, is guaranteed to be enough to pay for the financing that's put in place uh, and that the ESCOs themselves um, either perform or they write checks to make sure that that, 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 um, that payment is actually there. Um, but what happens at the end of the contract? And, and how long do these contracts typically last? And what happens to the savings after that? Well, <coughs> Uh, two savings questions. Uh, the savings after that all belong to the um, to the agency, to the public agency. The uh, any excess savings that are generated during the course of the contract belong to the public agency. Recent audit of the federal performance contracting program indicates that the federal projects, on average, are producing about 20 percent more savings than the guarantee. The projects in the public facilities last anywhere from 10 to 20 years, typically. Uh, that's the length of the contract. Again, there's, there's a useful way to think about these projects in the public facilities is that this is really a way to pay for needed public improvements. So you don't, you don't compare this with a lighting project, you compare this with a bond issue that would have to be uh, issued to do these public improvements in a, in a, uh, in a different part. So they typically tend to point contracts 
and any excess savings so I to so I wanted to ask everyone, just uh, again, a friendly reminder um, to mute your lines. We are getting some feedback on the, I think, the best and the toughest question for last. Uh, and this, I won't say who this comes from, but uh, uh, the question is uh, really about the future. And as you know, John, Emerald City is currently active in, in 10 markets around the country. Uh, and we've got boots on the ground, local directors, steering committees, uh, local councils who are working very, very hard and diligently to develop these energy efficiency markets, particularly in the mush marketplace, because that's one of our focuses. And getting back a little bit to the question about how Emerald Cities and our stakeholders can work with the ESCO industry, uh, is it realistic to, to think that um, that Emerald Cities and our network can actually help the ESCO industry develop deal flow, and is that valuable to the ESCO industry? Um, I think the answer to the first question is yes. To the extent that Emerald Cities is a local organization which has strong local presence, local, strong local presence. I think its members as you think of the chapters grow. They will develop stronger and stronger political presence. I think she begins to make a very powerful uh, local presence. But that presence is, is focused on the problem of breaking down the barriers to energy efficiency, particularly in public facilities. When uh, we've discussed a little bit, the barriers are not insurmountable. These are not these are not huge problems to face. They're mostly bureaucratic problems. There's nothing fundamentally wrong with the with the issue or with the, the offer of doing these projects in public facilities. It makes perfect sense. There is no reason not to do it. So I think I feel very strong that if there is a local political presence in Seattle steam, this is a pretty easy target to approach. I think to the extent that that the captors are able to make these projects to make these projects go, then yes, that's worth something. I don't know how that you know that can be monetized in fact I haven't actually thought that through. And one thing to, to think about is that in each of these projects uh, individual projects across the country, they're governed by state procurement laws, which specify competition. So how how you can again how you monetize a a political company competing for the project is not immediately clear to me. That doesn't mean that there is a way to do it. I just don't have a quick answer. John, sounds like we we have some things that we can work together uh, for moving this market and, and developing the energy efficiency sector. Um, clearly, everyone in this space is, is motivated to do that. We've come to the end of the session, and again, I want to apologize for everybody who hung in there with our technical difficulties. Hopefully, we rectified the sound and, and the video problem. Uh, I understand that some of you may still be having some problems, and we will continue to work on that technology uh, to make sure it doesn't happen again. I wanted to thank John Gilligan uh, for his time and his insights today uh, on the topic of working uh, with uh, energy services companies and energy services performance contracting. The information that was presented today will be available on our member site, and we will make sure to post that for all of you. And don't forget that uh, Don is one of our board members, and he will be available at various uh, Emerald City functions along the way, and uh, that he's very approachable. And I'm sure that he'd be very willing to end. And thank you all very much for participating. Yeah, and I would just, yeah, I would just like to second that. I've spent, as Kevin said in the introduction, I've spent 35 years uh, in the energy efficiency business. So I'm happy to talk to anybody who's trying to push, trying to push this part up. up the same hill. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Thank you all very much.